icon in that list, same list as the share screen and there's a camera so, icon. Then a so we are live right now. I've done nothing, but we are live right now. <laughs> and I think that we're going to, are we going to start? Yeah, are you ready? Yeah, okay. So the subject we are going to talk about right now is, uh, on the one hand, a very traditional one in art history. It relies on soul searching or research. And the title is The Arts Enabling Us to Look into Each Other's Soul. And my question would be, um, is this topic still relevant today? And does art still function as a door opener for deep feelings and um, this concept is also um, relies also on the on the concept of the masterpiece so is this still relevant today and what does it mean to you as an artist and is art a cry for self-liberation or to aspire beauty in the mundane so today there's the opportunity to talk about these major art topics and um, so let's say it's self-liberation, beauty and deep feelings in art and invited is a group of artists and I would like to welcome you and we all have different backgrounds in the arts so and I would suggest that you start uh, with Jonathan here right now with your intro introduction into your working practice. And afterwards, we can we can make the round, so each after the other, and then we're going to look at also at cross-connections between all these different backgrounds. And with these cross-connections, I would say, or I would suggest that the, we're going to deepen these cross-connections with these topics like beauty, self-liberation. So, yeah, does this work for you? So... <laughs> so, Thank you, so Melanie, please. for giving me the opportunity to, to kick off this wonderful panel. Um, I am the founder and artistic director of a dance company in New York City. It's called Battery Dance. It's named after Lower Manhattan, where we were founded, which actually was a part of the city that had no theaters, no art galleries, no space for art, one could say. And so our first experience was to go out into the public space in a park and bring dance and music into that park at lunchtime so that people coming out of the law firms and banks and, and business that populated the area could um, experience something of our expression. And when we saw that over a thousand people gathered for that first performance, we thought, oh, okay, so we need to come out of our dance studios and out of our private space and into the public sphere. And that way we can impact people and have an audience. And that informed the growth of the company over the last 45 years in which we have worked in 70 countries around the world, as well as staying very rooted in New York, in lower Manhattan, particularly after 9-11, we felt like um, we could be part of the rebirth of an area of the city that had really been through a trauma, um, physically and emotionally and psychologically. So um, you're talking about the liberation of the soul and, and self-awareness and, and the arts as a, a means of expression and storytelling. And I want to focus on the fact that we work with young people and we activate groups of young people in New York City public schools and around the world to find the dancer within. So dance, we feel, is too often segregated into a dance studio or a small black box theater or even a larger theater, but the people who already know about it are the ones who come and see it. But going back to that early experience of being out in a public space, um, I realized that we need to allow the arts to flourish everywhere and anywhere and give access to young people. So that's really what my practice is about at this point in my career is less about myself and my own self liberation, but helping other people liberate themselves through dance, through the arts. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's quite clear. And currently, currently you're also working with this project. Did I understand this right? Yes, we, we actually have been working in Germany, in Germany, because our, our teaching artists have been in New York or California 
zooming into um, households where young people are taking part from their homes if they're in, if they have been, um, you know, the need for social distancing has kept them out of the school building. Um, or in some cases, students have been able to be together, but they had to be socially distant or wearing masks. So we've been activating groups. We did 12 different uh, dance pieces. When I say we did, we activated 12 dance pieces across Germany um, over the last six months. And uh, all of the product of this, the, our films, dance films made by the students and edited by our professionals. And those are on a, the batterydance.org website, if anyone would like to access them. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So who wants to introduce um, him or herself next? Um, it's Tanya, maybe. Would you like to continue? Thank you. Um, so I'm an artist uh, in a more kind of introverted art form than Jonathan. Um, a lot of my processes and working time is uh, about my own relationship with my practice um, in a more private working environment, the studio space. Um, but from that base, I then want to work with others and I use um, the platforms that I have available to me to not only reflect on my own experience of being alive um, and, um, if you like, the witnessing of the soul, which is our kind of prompt for this conversation, but also to look at the challenges we face environmentally and collectively. And I'm going to just show you a few um, images of the technology work, so um, just to introduce a little bit of what I do. Um, oh, hold on. So hopefully this is going to work. I'm not sure it is working. I'm not screen sharing, am I? I can't share screen. Okay, I might have to talk you through these things. It's saying, the system's saying it won't let me share screen. But um, so I'm going to talk about um, a couple of projects that I've done recently that when preparing for this, I thought they were global in their topic. And given this is a global conversation, it seemed relevant, even though they have a very personal starting point. Um, in 2014, I made a work called All the Seas that was um, a started with, a, with an impulse to gather all the world's seawater to one place. And that meant working in a very participatory way through social media networks, Facebook, um, my own networks, and the uh, institution I was working with, the Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh, and their networks, to try and get people to send me seawater from all the world's seas. And even though on our planet we only have one ocean, we only have one water, uh, we do divide it up and we name it and we put kind of boundaries to that water and territorial kind of claims to it. But this is all one interconnected body of water. Um, so I presented this water that people did send me uh, as a kind of library of all the world's seas uh, in glass bottles. Um, and I had 365 samples, if you like, of seawater. I didn't test it. I didn't, I didn't kind of want scientific data from this work. What it was is a work that started about my relationship with the sea and then reached out to many people, a whole global network of seawater collectors to um, uh, kind of contain and archive their relationship with their bit of sea. And I had, had, had obviously, I had seas from around the world. Um, one of the strangest was two guys that were rowing across the Atlantic, collected some seawater halfway across and sent it to me. Um, there were very mm -hmm. signs down in the uh, south polar regions that sent me various bits of sea water I never dreamed I'd be able to add to this collection and it was very much a gifted work in, anthropolog in anthropological terms it was part of gift culture people gifted their 
bit of bottle of seawater to the project and this was then gifted back as an artwork that many people saw and then thought about their own kind of sea relationship um so that, that that exists as a kind of sculptural object that gets shown in various places and institutions um that i made a while ago um the most recent piece of work that I've made that's left the studio is um, uh, a baton that's made uh, out of slices of driftwood. I made this during pandemic, during lockdown, so I had to visit beaches very local to me to gather this material. And I fashioned a new kind of log or baton or stick um, with these pieces of slices of driftwood that were turned on a lathe and then I drew onto them and this baton is part of the Relay for Nature which is an initiative that the ocean race which is a world um, sailing race has taken on and integrated into its um, sort of whole ethos um, so it's an unusual uh, intersection of an art object a symbolic object um, a sporting event and an environmental agenda um, and the baton has a, a stainless steel chamber inside of it that people are writing on um, putting putting messages into this baton and it's been passed from various sailing crews that are in, in the race uh, environmentalists um, people in positions of power and government scientists, children um, you know citizens it's being passed around the world um, hopefully it will be presented at COP26 in Glasgow later this year and various other kind of ocean conferences and events and um, the first person I passed it to was Ambassador Peter Thompson who is the UN Special Envoy for the Oceans so that that was me passing it to him and he passed it on to the Relay feature and I suppose it fits again with this idea that um, you know we are only here now whatever we do we pass on to the next generation and I want to use arts and um, my kind of um, creative energy to keep various kind of environmental and uh, critical issues both in our conscious and unconscious minds by doing whatever I can on whatever platforms are available to me. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. So your approach is very, very collaborative, as um, as I understand it. And um, I have one one um, question in terms of this uh, a collection of different uh, sea water in bottles. Um, have you done certain research about the different origins uh, of the sea water, or could you differentiate it because of their different appearance? Um, it, was quite, it, was, it was quite important for me that this was not a data generating project. This was um, something that explored personal and poetic and psychological connection okay. to the sea. Yeah. I, I fear that climate messages are often delivered in statistics, which is uh, a way that I think isn't um, the most direct form of communication for many people. And I wanted this to be a much more kind of emotional register yeah. that, that would uh, sit in people's conscious and unconscious reckoning. Okay, thank you. No. Yeah, and I think it's also interesting in terms of Anthropocene approach, you know, in terms of this, um, yeah, maybe we can talk about this also later. Um, now we go on with a presentation. Who wants to present next? Um, it's maybe Katya, Tom, Face. Who's the next? Yeah, thank you, Tom. Oh, we 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 can't hear you. The the sound, the sound is missing. Is that good? Yeah. So um, I wouldn't pretend to be able to answer the questions that you put. Um, at the beginning, I think all I can really do is to sort of reflect, and I, I'm kind of proposing to use a particular piece of work to show you, and I sort of think it's for others uh, to sort of comment on what they what it provides access to. Um, having said that, you did ask, are there still masterpieces? 
out there. I think we've just heard about two of them. Yeah. I'm sure we're going to hear about another two in a minute. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so I, I was at a, a talk about 10 years ago and heard somebody I have a lot of respect for who said that all creativity comes from stillness. And I must say that's something that's resonated with me um, ever since, where stillness is the place that things that have entered the mind, you know, things that have entered the mind, uh, the mind becomes quiet and now allowing a connection with the sort of universal energies or the, uh, an idea, a place where ideas are sort of given, as it were. And sometimes it takes a long period of time or several iterations. And sometimes it's more of a lightning bolt um, in, in when you're stillness for, for, for an idea to come. But either way, the germ of an idea will go through practical stages in order to become an object um, that's going to be shared. And I'm going to try and share, if I can. Um, share that. Okay. Can you see that? Can you see that? Um, yeah. No, I can see yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, so uh, this is a sculpture called My Space. And I wanted to explore, effectively, aspects of my space in the world. So it's made from acrylic, um, and the form you see inside is actually cut out. So there's nothing there but the marks left by creating the space. Um, and it's an, an expression of a number of things that play on my mind. I mean, there are times when the work almost disappears, particularly when it's not shown in this sort of studio-lit way. And also, interestingly, the closer you get, people tend to look closely at a thing, thinking they're going to get more detail. But actually, the closer you look at it, the less you get from it, um, which is a thing I was quite interested to see as a kind of an exploration, I suppose, of my own, my own personality. Um, so I was interested to see what was revealed by reducing what I included. So there's no color. Um, there's as much space between the layers as there is layers themselves. And the form that I'm describing, as I mentioned, actually isn't there. But in a really interesting way, it does speak of, of who I am, I think. Uh, so I've used 3D scanning, computer-aided design, laser cutting to create this sculpture, partly because I wanted it to be placed in this time. I didn't want it to be something that could have been made 20 years ago. Um, and I think it's true to say... Uh, that I'm more engaged with the process and the decisions of the making and the resonances of the tools that I use and the materials than I am in the end result. Um, the end result is kind of what happens, but the idea and the process is what is perceived uh, or what comes from, from the stillness. So I'm rather hoping that... Have I stopped sharing now? Thank you very much. The technology works. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, the human body, um, who is it? Is it your body or does it count who is it? It happens to be my body, which, which as the maker of the piece, I think is, I think is important. Um, but as far as anyone else is concerned, I don't think it is important. Because if it doesn't speak to anybody else, then it's, it's, it's no good. <laughs> So, okay. and, and it doesn't speak to anybody else because it's me. It speaks to any, it speaks to anybody else because it's a form and people see something of themselves in it. Okay. And uh, can you tell just uh, one sentence to the material? Uh, it's made out of um, what, what type of material? Yeah, it's made out of acrylic. And the reason I use acrylic is because it's very utilitarian. You normally get supermarket shelves made of it. It's not mm -hmm. a kind of classical sculpture material. But I really like that. Again, it's it's part of the it's the everyday, it's the sort of accessibility of it, and um, yeah, it's the kind of not something. I mean, there's an awful lot of sculpture which, you know, in its making and and in its presentation is set apart, and you look up to it, and it, it so that that sort of sets a dynamic in the relationship you can have with the work, and um, although the, this piece I you know made is is life size. So for somebody very small, they're going to be looking up to it. Um, mm -hmm. The reality is it's, it's, it's only life size. It's no bigger than I am. And um, so, yeah, I kind of wanted it to be approachable in that respect. Mm -hmm. So it's a confrontation with another human body. Like when I, when I perceive it, it's, it's like a confrontation with another human body. 
I hope that people, uh, yeah, I mean, I get that that thought might pass through people's minds, but I hope, and, and I'm sure to, to a large extent, I'm going to, to hear what my colleagues on the panel say, but um, I, you kind of make, I, for me, I make art from a place, and I, and I you know, think about it, it kind of came from the soul, the things that were very important to me that I was exploring in that work. Um, but the reason for putting it out there, I guess, is that you hope that one or two people, other people in the world are going to connect with it in a way that it's not an other body. It's it's um, it's something of themselves. Ah, OK, I see. Yeah, this circle when I yeah, uh, when I perceive the other human body, I perceive myself and I feel connected. Yeah. OK, yeah. I, yeah, thank you. And, and as a dancer, choreographer, I completely relate to that idea because when people see dancers, they see themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So it's this. Yeah. Thank you. So, Katya on face, who wants to continue? So, Katya, you? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, um, um, my work is about or revol revolves around the intertwining of time, space, and movement. Movement. So um, the aspect of time is very important uh, important for me because um, I work with this uh, aftermath and aftermath idea or, or of the. Past is not um, past, actually. <laughs> so I work with trauma and memory also in my work. And um, we have lots of space, actually. The universe is quite big, but we don't have so much time. So we feel limited in our lives. So we hurry through space. We hurry from here to there. And we construct a lot of aims. And, and through that... Um, my idea is, but I, I find it also a lot of Virilio also, he, he spoke about it, about this um, shrinking of the universe because we lose the space because we, we hurry through space and we, we take the plane or the car. So, and I visualize this in my work um, uh, through interfolding and um, so there's kind of lots of uh, works that are kind of folded um, they kind of it's about the shrinking space, and uh, on the other hand, there are works uh, that are unfolding. So this is kind of more about the potential of of uh, of yeah potential of future or of, of everything actually that contains everything. And um, so I work quite in a classical way. I, I work with culture. I, actually, I prepared some stuff on my desktop, but I'm so afraid to use that that I kind of lose you when I switch to my desktop now. So I will not do it. But I have a sculpture in my uh, in my room. You can see it. I don't know if you can see anything there, standing there. And um, <laughs> so um, so I, I work a lot with metal because I like to freeze the movement. Uh, into this material because kind of holding the moment is kind of freezing this moment, and, and I like also to uh, to have still the distance. I'm I, I'm never work kind of interactive or too much open my sculpture. I'm very busy because I for me it's very important to have this distance principle with reviewing because I I want that people kind of have the space to contemplate and to look. So it's a really look, uh, a lot about seeing and, and looking and feeling the form. So I'm working a lot with form and I'm, I'm kind of developing the, the forms out of myself. I'm kind of, I have a metal workshop and um, so I, I work there and um, I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur artist. <laughs> I, I need to kind of develop my forms myself. And uh, because a lot in this process, I find find the forms. And forms itself is for me uh, also creature of limitation. You know, it's three dimensional, so it's haunted also by time and space. And that's for me very interesting. And um, through the process of uh, working my studio, is kind of witnessing my my own um, 
existence, kind of. So um, I think that's why I really want to stay with doing my work myself. Sometimes is sure I need help when I make bigger sculptures, but um, I love it just to to work with hands. So I'm, and um, there's also sort of paperwork you see in the background. I'm also doing these uh, traditional uh, paperworks. They're kind of made out of um, textile, original. So the material or the, the work is also what I told you a lot about this past, this pressure of the past, or which is not gone, so it's still alive. And um, very often people say my work is connected to constructivism. And this comes also out of the idea of a dramatized um, one's life wish of creating future, but for me it's now a past future. So, and um, I, I feel still that it's kind of a dramatized idea. And um, so now uh, I'm at the point, I, I worked like kind of 20 years about this dramatized uh, now. And um, so now it's more about what's upcoming is more about this idea of unfolding about future. And my impression is also uh, what I found really remarkable with your work is that you work with triangle forms very often. Is there a particular yeah. reason for this that you um, very often use triangle forms? Yeah, I think because it's dynamic, the triangle is very dynamic form. And I work a lot with things falling down. Yeah, Also, also the paperwork you see in the background. Um, I, so things fall down into the space and they fall why they fall, they fold. And mm -hmm. this is kind of also the dynamic of, um, of how trauma is kind of happening. So something kind of happens, it comes into your life suddenly, it, it kind of falls into your body and then it unfolds certain structures and systems maybe you cannot stop. And um, so I kind of worked uh, all the years also to develop my uh, my language of form. So because I I want to express um, this time-space relation in an abstract way. So I, I was looking for this, for my own language. And um, so this is kind of part of it, the triangle, yeah. Yeah, I, I like the expression language of form. So yeah. thank you very much, Katja. So no offense, it's up to you. Hi, so yeah, I'm Faith and I'm from South Africa. I am a multidisciplinary artist and I think I would like to share some images while I talk just to give you some understanding of what I'm talking about. So let me just bring those up. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in making work that is a screen shared, by the way. Everybody yeah. can see it. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm interested in making work that speaks about compassion and uh, finding a visual language that exists outside the realm of words and actually speaks directly to the heart. Um, the thematics that move me are informed by somewhat by my growing up in South Africa and the kind of social inequalities that I witnessed there um, on a microcosm scale of, um, I think, the macrocosm of the world. Um, and I would say that my work is a process of my own spiritual search or my own spiritual evolution, kind of looking for unity within a segregated world and searching for a life of meaning. Um, a world where people are not seen as consumers, but uh, seen as human beings who deserve a soul, a soulful existence, you know, not just a commodity. Uh, I work a lot in the public environment. I'm very interested in public art. I think that um, it's really important because it can reach the man on the street. It's accessible. It has direct impact on the environment um, and the community that surrounds it and um, yeah, I believe that it's possible for each of us to have an impact on the society we live in through what we do and uh, for me art making is intensely personal, it's part of my own 
a kind of sacred quest for understanding my inner world, but also understanding the, the external world and um, relating to others. I, I think that um, it's also a way to actually contribute to the wider conversations of society. And um, I'm also interested in revering the divine feminine and kind of finding our own innate powers um, as humans to um, also represent kind of diverse cultures. I'm interested in connecting to the natural world and helping people to connect and cities to connect to the natural world and to introduce magic and mystery into the everyday life and kind of bring the sacred into the mundane, you know, to to kind of spark people's imagination and inspiration. Um, yeah, I, I kind of want to just question what it means to be human and uh, look at what is like, what is life affirming and what is, uh, what is nourishing to us as human beings um, and to myself as a human being. You know, these are just questions that I, that I've, been considering and then it goes through my work and I think art is such a beautiful uh, well, creative realms are just so powerful because it gives us that space to relate to um, each other on a very human level and I think society these days unfortunately is um, becoming more and more distanced from the humanity of what it means to be human um, yeah that's that's me for now yeah, thank you. And I have a question. Is there a relationship between the building you choose for your painting and the painting? Or is it... Yes, always. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's very much site-specific. So it's got to do with not just the architecture and the aesthetics of the space, but also who's living in that environment. Like, um, what are the kind of... You, you know, it's something that it's it's quite tricky. It's something you're always searching to get right. And um, I actually love working in abandoned spaces just because they have this like kind of texture and history to them that already allows for uh, a really interesting conversation with the space. Um, I would much prefer that over like a blank white wall, like a sterile white wall, you know, something that has character. So um, yeah, very much so. Okay, and is it always is it easy for you to get these places uh, so that you can use them for your artworks, or uh, I mean, is there always a discussion about no. it that you can use I it started, on? I started painting a public art, street art. I actually came from a graffiti background, so when I was a teenager, right. so I've okay. been I see. Working yeah. in the kind of street environment um, doing public works since I was 16 and oh, yeah. a lot of it's been DIY but these days mostly it's commissions and people reach out to me um, you know from various different angles to to do projects yeah yeah okay thank you so uh, thank you very much for your presentation I am um, I, I think it's really amazing also this um, it's I think there are some connections between some works or approaches um, I would say and um, but now we can go on to another level to discuss these um, cross connections and also to come to this idea of liberation or self-liberation and um, Jonathan I was really impressed by what you have said in the beginning because you have said that um, art is uh, for you to help the others to liberate themselves so it's not about you as self-liberation, but to help the others to liberate themselves. And I mean, this is the reception part. And um, I think that we can maybe talk a bit more about the reception part. So what does, do you think when you conceptualize a work of art, do you think about the others? I mean, Tanya, for you, I think it's obvious because your work is collaborative. So, I mean, you work together with other people, but what does it mean to you, Tom? Do you think about the others when you conceptualize your work? Um, not particularly. I mean, other than uh, that we all share being human. And, um, you know, I think one of the, one of the kind of, 
common things I picked up, I think, from everybody is this idea of a, of a language, of art as a language. And yeah. I think we all look for that language, and clearly it's a non-verbal language. And, uh, and, and how people uh, receive that is, you know, is to, is to a large extent, um, you know, up to their own, uh, you know, there, there are sometimes you stand in front of a piece of work and you just, you just get it. Uh, and you don't necessarily know why. You know, the thousand people who came out into to watch Battery dance for their their first you know outing in the park. You know, what was it that attracted them? What was it that kept them? It was something non-verbal. And a friend of mine who's a dancer once said to me, "You know, if I had the words for it, I wouldn't need to dance." So, so to a certain extent, by having the conversation, we're we're trying to sort of, you know, uh, we're trying to verbalize things that, that, that are quite, quite tricky necessarily. But, um, uh, so, but, but your question, you know, do, do, am I thinking with an end user in mind when I'm making what I make? No, I'm not. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's something that I have a, have a need to, to express. And, um, you know, from a commercial perspective, it's fortunate if other people get it to the point where they, you know, they, they're interested in buying it or whatever, because that allows me to carry on, you know, financially doing what I'm doing. Um, and, and you kind of hope that there's a, there is something of, you know, in the context of this, this broader discussion, there is something of shared humanity that if we're able to express it, then it is there to be shared. And, um, uh, but it's not necessarily, it's not the motive behind the making. The motive behind the making is trying to be as clear in my language as I can be. Yeah. And um, the same way, uh, if I could jump in, <clears throat> say that when I am choreographing a piece, I do everything possible to shut out any of the outside voices. I don't want to be affected by self-criticism or the thought of how someone else will react to the work. If I did, I wouldn't be able to take a step. Okay. But in terms of the liberation idea, I feel like in 2006, having started my career in 1976, that everything, it's like I pressed the restart button. And that's when I discovered that young people, whether or not they had had any prior formal dance training, had their own language of movement. Before that, I thought you had to study dance, you had to have a rigorous um, understanding and approach to a style of movement, whether it's break dance or classical ballet or anything in between. And when I saw a group of young high school students reacting to an idea in Germany uh, about what happened in their grandparents' lives during... um, World War II, what happened on the ground where they were dancing or standing and sort of exploring their own, the, their country's history through movement. I was, I had to leave the room because I was so moved by what I saw. And these were not class, these were not dancers. They didn't know they were dancers, but they were making profound, authentic statements. And I saw at that point in 2006, this is everything for me now and everything changed. And I was able to um, liberate myself through the seeing liberation of others. Yeah. Thank you. And this is also based on this idea of transgenerational memory. You no, know, when they do something, what was concerned with their grandparents, you no, know, it's also what you do Katya and um, because your work is also based on memory although it's absolutely abstract no I mean there is more this um, transformation in it no like with uh, um, Kazimir Malevich or so as you mentioned the concretisme that uh, your work rely on no and I think this is also an approach which is not that visible but um more um, invisible, but it's it's like a constrict. Uh, const- it's more like the the um, the inner part of an artwork. I, 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 at the end, I would like to introduce a last question, and I would like to ask you what you think about it. It's um, one idea I had. So self liberation could also mean that an artist is not captured by the art market. 
What do you think about this? Well, um, I, I want also to, to um, mention to, the, to this aspect of self-liberation that uh, what do you actually mean with it? You mean a liberation of the self? Because actually the soul is kind of the opposite of the self. So uh, that's what I would say, that because uh, the soul is kind of an anti-identification. It's kind of exactly um, all possibilities of form. So... Um, And um, sure, everything that has a like depending or um, I don't know, say in English, abhängigkeit, yeah, like also the art market is uh, there's a lot of attraction here, you know, like money or things like that. And this is not uh, connected to to the soul. So I think, but I think being an artist is a good training um, to uh, to let things go and to to um, to train my own own freedom actually from. From, and to, to connect with nothingness, with nothingness in the end, I'm, I, I think it's kind of what my soul wants to learn through doing art is um, kind of to go away from somethingness to nothingness, and it's kind of the anti-form. That's why I said I'm so interested to create forms because I have to make a limitation, but it's kind of the expanding. Uh, or it has to contain everything. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we have uh, three more minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, Tanya. I I just wanted to kind of uh, endorse what Katya just said, and one of the reasons I work with water is because I feel like um, we have many selves, we have many souls, and I I like to work with a liquid form to represent that these things are all in flux. And um, I think art is a, uh, the ultimate container for the self, or um, you could call it the soul. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that, that word so much because of its religious association, faith-based <laughs> association. But, um, uh, and, and I literally work with containers. I, m I make things that are vessels that can in some way contain that notion of the liquid self. And um, in terms of this idea of liberation, um, again, that's, that's a very complicated term. What am I being liberated from and to? And who is my oppressor in this conversation? Mm -hmm. you know, could, could the whole idea of the arts or the masterwork be the oppressor in itself? So um, there are many things I would need to unpack about the use of the word liberating but I do think art gives people agency and better understanding and insight into their place in the world whether you make it or view it whether you absorb it whether you're a member of an artworks audience or community around an artwork in whatever form or whether you're the person making it so um Uh, for me, it's, I'm in more comfortable kind of territory to talk about agency um, rather than liberation. Thank you, um, Tanya. I think this was a very good. Um, it's very good to finish here because we have one more minute, and I think it's definitely too short. No, now we could start discussing. I think, but nevertheless, I mean, for me it was a pleasure. So um, thank you very much, and I was really amazed by that I got this insight in your working practice. Thank you very much for this. So, bye. <laughs> yeah. So, stop streaming, yeah. yeah.